in theory in one second. Have you got the notification that is recording? Yes, there yes, we go. Yeah. Perfect. Well, um, hello everyone who's, who's decided to come along. Um, my name's Matthew Coxon and uh, I'm going to be leading this sort of very brief webinar, seminar thing um, around my interest in uh, head mounted displays and the sort of overlap with cognitive psychology. Uh, so I'm a, a psychologist by trade and I'll try and sort of you know, just hopefully give you some guys some insight into some of the potential links between um, the way we think about things over in psychology and the way the technology can potentially be, be harnessed or used uh, in your everyday lives uh, versus potentially in your professional lives or whatever it may be. So I hope there will be something uh, you'll, you'll learn or take from this, uh, whatever that might be. Uh, so to get started, then I'm going to just share my screen um so bear with me one second uh whilst i get that up I'm gonna... so here we go now i'm hoping uh that we should be able to see yes. uh, hacker slides perfect thank you Viv. now obviously unfortunately when i present like this um i'm unable to see the chat now I'm always good for taking questions and I'm very happy to be interrupted or to, to go back over things. So if there is something you want to ask, uh, if you could pop it in the chat, that would be a great idea. And I've just had the brainwave of following the chat on my phone rather than, um, yeah, rather than looking, uh, trying to look at it on the screen. But Viv, I'm going to ask you a very small favour. If anything comes up, um, yeah, cool things noteworthy, they just shout out. Thank yeah, you very much. Cool joke. Appreciate it. Right. Um, OK, so the, the, the sort of title and the theme for the talk is all around the power of distraction. Um, and we're gonna, I'm going to kind of tell you about two things, really managing pain and reducing trauma uh, using head mounted displays. But my sort of the, the general gist of this is just to give you a little insight into uh, how cognitive psychologists think about the mind and how the mind processes the world and how that might overlap with with technology and how we could potentially use technology uh, in various ways uh, to help us. Now, the, the managing pain and the reducing trauma are just two examples uh, of situations where essentially uh, we want our mind to stop processing the world around us um, and there's benefits in, in doing so. Uh, so uh, that's the kind of general theme for today. I thought I'd take just a, a minute or so. So in, in total, I only hope to sort of chat for sort of 30, 35 minutes uh, and then uh, there'll be an opportunity to, for questions, but as I said, questions in the chat as we go along uh, is all good as well. Um, my, uh, uh, I guess my main focus has always been within cognitive psychology. So my my training, my undergraduate and postgraduate has all been within psychology. I think it's really, really important because um, I've no idea about your background, uh, except I know you're probably not cognitive psychologists uh, to say uh, I am not a therapist because I know when people see the word cognitive, uh, they often think of cognitive behavioral therapy, if they think of anything at all. Um, and uh, yeah, not a therapist, never have been, never will be. Uh, I am and most cognitive psychologists are essentially researchers, uh, researchers who are interested in how the human mind processes the world around it. So not necessarily in terms of emotive things or trauma, although of course I, I am going to mention those things, but the real basics, uh, so how we, we remember things, how we learn languages, what we pay attention to, how we process the visual world around us. Um, some people try and avoid the psychology tag and call themselves cognitive scientists to try and, try and get around that, but yeah, I think it's worth having not a therapist this isn't a therapy talk uh, i won't be trying to read your mind um instead i'm going to try and uh just give you some insight into uh some of the insights i've had over the sort of past 15 years uh where i've been uh involved in various degrees in research uh using head mounted displays again i'll probably i'll talk more about this a little bit later but what we now sort of more traditionally know as uh virtual reality and it's, it's the common reference to it is this idea of putting a headset on and experiencing a digital world uh, is something that I became uh, aware of back in 2004 2005 when I was down in Sussex and I ended up uh, collaborating with a computer scientist uh, who, who needed a psychologist on board to make sense of uh, some of the measures of memory she was using so she was creating these different virtual worlds and I've got some images of them later uh, and she wanted to know how well people were remembering them she 
getting some odd findings and that's where a, a cognitive psychologist comes in to try and explain why uh why people aren't remembering these worlds as well as you thought they would and all this kind of stuff now that's gone on much further and and more recently I, i'm particularly interested in well two things i'm interested in the sort of cognitive basis of using this sort of technology but more specifically uh how we can harness what we know about cognitive psychology uh, and our mind and how the mind processes the world and uh how we can use the technology and bring the two together uh and, and somehow do some good or find some applications for it which are a bit different and slightly non-obvious uh, so yes, non-obvious applications of, of the technology is uh, kind of where I'm going to go. So today then, uh, sort of for the next, I guess now, 25 minutes, um, I want to talk to you about three things really. Uh, I'm going to hopefully give you some insight into the, the role that attention plays in our everyday lives that we're potentially unaware of, uh, but it's significant and it's influential in how we process the world around us and uh, just process things in general. Uh, I'm then going to pitch to you that virtual reality is, is amazing as a, an attentionally demanding medium. I'm going to try and persuade you that of all the sort of mediums available to us from, from reading reading a book, watching a film, trying to distract ourselves in our minds, that uh, virtual reality uh, is uh, quite impressive in terms of uh, the amount of attention it can, can demand of us. And actually, there are ways we can bring these things to do together. We can take these sort of facts these are, uh, about the mind that have been established over the sort of last hundred years, uh, and we can take this technology and we can potentially bring the two together uh, in, in a meaningful way. So there we go. I hope that's going to be of interest. I'm not sure what you thought I was going to be talking about, uh, but this is it. Uh, so cognitive psychology then. And I'm going to say I'm going to this is so broad brush um, is it's very much introductory. So apologies if you know more about cognitive psychology, uh, but um, I hope this is of interest and I have things to do as well. <laughs> apologies. I'm going to make you do things if, if you are there. Um, so. Uh, what's fascinating about cognitive psychology, so if you go and talk to, sort of, to psychologists and you talk about how we understand how the mind works and we look at the history of it, we kind of trace the history back to the sort of 40s, 50s, 60s and the analogy between um, the mind and computers was, was very strong. How we began to really understand the mind uh, was to drag the analogy of computers uh, over. So everything from having systems and processes, ideas of things like memory uh, and processing resources and all these sorts of ideas uh, that sort of still float about now. Uh, so as psychologists, we, we basically view, uh, quantitative psychologists, we basically view um, sort of humans as, as mini computers now that analogy has moved on and we're sort of 67 years later um and there's, there's much more complex ways of thinking about it but there's still uh some fundamental principles which underpin it uh this sort of understanding of how the mind works so when i say how the mind works to sort of reiterate this is sort of how we learn things how we reason how we solve problems it's these very conscious things but also how we perceive the world around us how uh, our attention is allocated often with us uh, knowing how we remember things how we struggle to remember things all of this sort of stuff falls within this this broad analogy of the mind as uh, as being like a computer and it has certain properties to it our minds uh, which we can exploit and we can demonstrate um, which is I think we're all fairly aware of this that we uh, uh, many of our processes rely on limited capacities, so we can only remember so much, we can only attend to so much, we can only uh, learn so much, we can only hear so much, so on and so forth. But it's uh, coupled up with uh, this sort of limited processing efficiency. We we aren't supercomputers, unfortunately. Uh, we only have uh, so many cognitive resources. This is the terminology that's used, cognitive resources that we can devote to, to processing the world around us uh, in different ways. Now, I have a couple of demonstrations for this now. Now, I don't know because I can't see you how up for it you are, <laughs> but I'm going to take a punt and I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with it. And then if if we get uh, silence at the end of it, then I'll just think this is just like any other teaching session during, during the past year. So I won't worry too much about that. Um, but uh, what I'm going to be asking you to do is to grab uh, a pen and piece of paper, or if you're on a computer, just bring up a Word document, whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, hopefully, most of you will be able to, to make 
use of the chat function as well. Because what I'm going to do to try and demonstrate these basic principles is give you some little memory tests. Here we go. So this is our classic way of demonstrating these principles is uh, to, to have a little bit of fun and games with some memory. And then I've got a brief video that should hopefully uh, demonstrate and illuminate uh, all of these ideas. So yes, yeah, so I'm hoping now having spoken, you should, you should be able to get a pen and a piece of paper. You do not need to write anything down immediately. Uh, the way these things kind of work is that um, I will say some words uh, at a fairly steady pace, and then at the end, I will ask you to to write them down, to recall them as best you can. Okay, and this is, this is trust me on this one. <laughs> I, I know what I'm doing. Um, so, assuming we're all ready, uh, being unable to see your faces, um, I'm going to go for the first list. So, I'm going to read out a list of words and then at the end I just want you to recall it. I'll then go back over it, we'll mark it and then I'd, it'd be good in the chat to see how many you got correct. So this is this is our drill. So here we go. These are the words. No writing down till the end, sorry. These are the words. Drum, curtain, bell, coffee, school, parent, moon, and now I'm just going to distract you for a few seconds just simply by talking uh, and then say write those down as best you can. So try and write down those words as best you can. Now obviously I'm unable to see you doing it so I'm going to count to 10 so uh, internally <laughs> so you have a uh, count to 10 to write down as many of those words as you can remember. Uh, here we go. So hopefully you've managed to write some of those down and now we're going to go back through them. So here are those words. It was drum, it was curtain, it was bell, it was coffee, school, parent and moon. And to get some life out, I'd like you to put how many you got correct. If you're happy to, no, no compulsion. If you're happy to, how many you got correct in the chat? Um, thank you. That's, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Three, seven. Amazing. There were only seven on the list, Warren, so that's kind of impressive. Uh, and if we tap on psychology now, that might inhibit everybody else's responses. <laughs> seven, four, five, three. Awesome. Thank you very much. It also lets me know that you're alive and you're engaging out there. So that's that's amazing. Thank you. Um, so if you thought that was tricky, let's go again. Uh, so there you go. You're not off the hook yet. Um, so here we go. So uh, our capacity, if we're going to say, so this is our limited capacity. Uh, we're looking at it floating around the four or five mark at the moment. Uh, let's go for this. This is uh, a longer list, so bear with me. Here we go. How many of these can you remember? Doll, mirror, nail, sailor, heart, desert, face, letter, bed, machine, milk, helmet, music, horse, road there we go that was all of them uh how many of those are you able to remember so take the next 10 15 seconds to write down those that you can recall Right, let's see. So we're going to run through now. Sorry, apologies if you haven't got down to writing as many as you could have, uh, but you'll know. So uh, the answers were dull, mirror, nail, sailor, heart, desert, face, letter, bed, machine, milk, helmet, music, horse, road. So again, add them up. If you could uh, pop in the chat how many you got correct. That would be awesome if you have to. Five, nine. So Melissa, that's a little upturn. That's awesome. Eleven. Amazing, Tony. Tony, what did you get before? Four. Four. Thank you, Tony. You're demonstrating what I need to. Warren, you got seven again. Uh, that's awesome. So essentially what we're finding and what we see is that um, for some of you, you kind of hit your capacity first time round. <laughs> Three, Darren, you do suck at that as apologies. Come do my memory improvement course. You, you won't suck at it later on. Um, <laughs> So uh, basically, even if we went on, if we now had a list of 25, I'm not going to put you through this or a list of 30 or whatever it might be, you'll find you have a limit. 
Uh, now, you don't always hit that limit every single time. We're not uh, machine-like. There's lots of factors that influence these sorts of things. But if we look at Warren Warren, for example, uh, your limit seems to be around seven. And the classic limit is uh, between five and nine. That's kind of the classic limit. So seven plus or minus two. Um, why am I demonstrating this? Well, there's a few things that will hopefully have have happened whilst you were doing this. So one thing that would happen is obviously you become very aware of your own limits. Um, the another thing that would happen is some of you, I believe, may have tried uh, doing something slightly different the second time round. You might have tried a different strategy. You might have tried linking them together. You might have tried saying them really quickly in your head. You might have tried something else, uh, or you might have just tried doing it off the bat, uh, just how you've done it before. And indeed, if you did try a strategy, I'd be interesting to hear uh, about it in the chat. Um, you may have found it more challenging, hopefully, once you started hitting around the seven or eight mark and you're trying to rerun some of these things in your head over and over again. And the point behind this and really what I want to get is that not only uh, do we have a limited capacity, not only do we have so much that we can remember, but there's processing going on as well. And what you're having to do is you're having to balance off some competing demands. So I'm still talking, <laughs> I'm still giving you new words, I'm giving you new information, but you're having to balance that off uh, as in, in trying to uh, remember the previous ones. You're trying to having to, to suppress any sort of internal monologue as well whilst you're thinking about, oh, this is really hard. You've probably missed a word at the same time as well. And you're basically having to sort of carefully balance your attention between attending to uh, the, the words that I'm reading, attending to any sort of internal processing you're doing. So for example, Amy, uh, you've said that you tried to visualize it. So you're creating a story. So whilst I was saying those words, you're creating a story out of them but you're balancing that off again of course and we're, we're trying to actually just listen the attentional resources that are needed to listen and so on and so forth um so here is, is a finer demonstration of just how challenging it is uh, to divide our attention because here that was a simple task now i'm going to do something and you, this is where if you're a psychology student you're quite used to this if you're not you're not really uh here's my finger um, can can you everyone? Uh, hopefully, people can see a picture of me and my finger yeah. in the corner of the screen. Cheers, Viv. Thank you. So, what we're going to do is we're going to do two things at once. Da -da. You think we should be able to do this? I'm going to read you one more list, which is well within your capacity limits, uh, and uh, I'm going to be doing this with my finger as well. And I'm going to be asking you to do two things, uh, which is to try and remember the words and to try and count how many times I twitch my finger, uh, and I'll try and count too, how many times I twitch my finger whilst we're trying to memorize these lists. So here we go. And I may well have lost someone at this point, but bear with me, look at me, listen to the lists, here we go. So dish, jester, hill, coat, tall, forest, water, ladder, foot. There we go. So you're doing two things here. I want you to recall as many of those words as you can, but also write down how many times a uh, twitchy finger came out. OK, here we go. Five more seconds to write those that you can remember. And of course, you have to suppress that competing thought of uh, what the hell is going on <laughs> right now. <laughs> There's lots to do here. So uh, the words were dish, jester, hill, coat, tall, forest, water, ladder and foot. Hit me with it then. Um, so um, just how many you remembered would be the, the, the useful one here. Amy, you've gone for five, even though you were visualizing. See, we've knocked you down from nine. You've got five first time. Darren, you're one up. Melissa, you're back down. Tony, we floored you. Awesome, Warren. So, whereas at various points, and these things are full of variants, uh, we were getting up around seven, nine, eleven, six finger bends. Thank you. So the next question is, how many finger bends were in there? Uh, although it was a, an irrelevant task. So yeah, we've limited how much you can remember. Ever so seven, Amy has gone for seven is what I had. Um, six, seven, six. But it's what we call an irrelevant task. The exact number is not important. Merely that one tries to attend to it. Um, but everyone got six. Maybe me and you were wrong, Amy. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was. Maybe it was six. Who knows? But the actual number of finger bends is, is unimportant. What's important is, again, we're simply uh, demonstrating uh, that so two competing demands, uh, simply dividing our attention between two things can limit our ability on one. So remembering words is ostensibly, is, it's, it's verbal, it's memory. 
uh, watching something that's visual over here uh, requires different things. It's, it's visual, you're, you're counting, these are very different skills. But whilst we have what we call domain specific resources, resources that we specifically use for remembering words, for counting things, there's also a set of what we'd call domain general resources, the cognitive resources which can be used for anything. And in fact, we rely heavily on these, these the sort of allocation and reallocation of these resources all of the time. So whatever tasks we're doing here, we're doing silly psychology tasks. But uh, for, let's take the classic example, if you're driving or cycling or walking, uh, um, you have there's a certain automaticity there's things you do automatically but you're you're still monitoring the environment for hazards uh, you're still potentially talking to someone you may be on your phone you may be listening to music uh, you shouldn't be on your phone in the car though bear that in mind uh, unless it's hands-free uh, whatever it might be uh, we are in a constant state of uh, balancing these demands so balancing our resources where we're allocating our attention and I want to show you one more thing uh, that should hopefully nail this home for you um, and if you give me one second, it does involve um, hitting a link and links rarely. And there we go. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to open this independently on YouTube. Um, other services are available uh, and just uh, switch across to sharing my screen. So we'll do a little bit of a share screen shuffle. Um, so you'll have to bear with me one second whilst we do this. La la la. Uh, and it's a very short video. Um, let me make sure I share computer audio. Um, it's a very short video, but I think it wonderfully demonstrates the principles I want to get across. So apologies again if you've seen it already. But uh, as it'll be explained, the, the thing here, I've told you, <laughs> this is I've prepped you, haven't I? That uh, your limited information processors, you don't really uh, process the world brilliantly all of the time. Um, let's have a look at this. So all you have to do is count the number of changes you can spot. Um, so here we go, I'll play it, and you just count how many changes you can spot in the scene. It's like a minute long, okay. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> But how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Why, madam? It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? So I'm going to pause it at that point. I hope you can still see me. And now, OK, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, so in the chat, how many changes did you spot? How many changes to that scene, very roughly, uh, did anyone spot? And I'm going to see what people are going for. Here we go. So, Amy, you saw three. Thank you. Thank you for opening. Uh, so the opening bid is three. Five from Warren. Tony, and for, <laughs> you're probably feeling pretty good now. You come in. Sue, you've got ten. Nancy, five. Here we go, then. So let's see. Uh, well, 21 changes. So this is it. Count them as we go through. 21 changes to that scene. Um, okay. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> there we go. So that was all 21 uh, different changes which you could or uh, most potentially didn't spot um, whilst uh, you're reviewing that video. Um, I will try and explain the significance of that. Um, 
as cognitive psychologists, we have fun with, with all this kind of stuff. But really, what is at the heart of it is that there is so much going on uh, in our worlds around us. We pay very little attention to, to any of it, although we still exist and have this, there's this feeling of a continuous world. We feel the world is coherent and continuous around us. Um, and indeed, if you thought if you shut your eyes at this moment and something magically disappeared in the room and you open them up again, you'd be able to spot what it was. Uh, you'd think that you should be able to do these things. Uh, as cognitive psychologists, we've learned that people can't and they don't. Um, and indeed, what I absolutely love about that video, I don't know about anyone else, but when you start watching it and they start seeing the changes, I think, oh, they're relatively minor. I, of course, I missed that. Of course, I missed that. And then they change people. <laughs> the person on the floor changes. The coats change. The, the, the dressing in the room changes entirely. Um, um, and it's yeah hopefully it opens your eyes a little bit to to this idea that we're going with that we have and it's not it's not an arbitrary thing we often think oh i'm not very good at remembering things or i didn't really pay attention to that one thing and the kind of the, the implicit assumption is that you're paid attention to everything else that you took on 98 percent of everything else that was said or had happened or was going on and you missed that two percent whereas in fact the proportions uh, are much larger than that as in the amount that we miss and, and we never know because we never process it um if you're interested in this kind of stuff there's a, a google invisible gorilla which is this wonderful video where uh, you have a task and you can you can totally miss a gorilla uh, i haven't used that one because i think uh, a fair few people might have seen that who knows already because it did the rounds for a bit um but whatever the point is i guess what i'm trying to do is just very quickly within that 10 minutes just demonstrate to you that as cognitive psychologists that kind of what we're bringing to the party is this understanding of the mind that uh, it's a constant balancing act between a very limited set of uh, uh, cognitive resources and there's nuances as to how we distribute those things but the basic gist is that a lot of the time uh, we do, we're not aware of things and a lot of the time uh, our resources are used for, for processing a very limited amount of information around us. Oh, sorry, Amy. Bye bye. Sorry, I just saw your chat message. Sorry, you can catch up. Um, so uh, the question mark then becomes, do we always want to process everything? When we start to think about technology, we often think about technology, in particularly sort of robotics at the moment, about enhancing ourselves. So I've gone for this pitch that we're limited information processors, we have limited resources. And uh, at the end of the day, um, we often use technology to enhance things. But actually, I want to adjust. This is my spin. This is my thing uh, for today is to actually try and let's think about it the other way around. So uh, hopefully you'll be relieved. I've got a little image on the right hand side that says content warning. I'm not actually going to show anything. Uh, it's merely one of these things that's become much more popular in the eight, last eight or nine years uh, of, of having warnings before uh, people view harmful or, or traumatizing videos. I mean, uh, if we draw on everyday experience, I'm pretty confident uh, there's things that people wish they'd never heard <laughs> and wish they could get rid of it, wish they'd never seen and wish they could get rid of it. I currently have an image of Matt Hancock on CCTV in a clinch <laughs> that I, I, I wish I'd never seen. I wish I just trusted the text as to what it involved uh, and I can't get rid of that. Um, but there's there's more serious things as well. So um, the, the classic example, and I'll, I'll bring you give you two examples uh, and and kind of link it in with HMDs is uh, processing pain. So things we often distract ourselves from a pain. You know, think now of of where someone might give the sort of sage advice of try to think of something else or try to distract yourself. Um, so perceiving pain is one, um, but having a traumatic experience. And I'm using that image of Matt Hancock lightly, but uh, it was fairly traumatic. And again, uh, uh, traumatic experiences are often associated with sort of unconscious, unwanted imagery, as is lots of stuff, as is cravings. You, you don't want to crave something. You can't stop thinking about something. I have a, I have a four year old now who asks for a chocolate biscuit. I say no. And she said, but my brain won't stop thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, she's got a point. And I'm like, like, to, like her thinking in those terms. Um, but there's lots of circumstances where actually um, it's kind of the opposite way around. We don't want to be processing things more deeply or more efficiently. Uh, and in fact, there are some benefits to not <laughs> further processing, not embedding within uh, our long term memories some things. And this is where the sort of HMDs technology side comes into it. So the images I've used here are sort of from two very different time periods, uh, just because I like these. So this is the very sort of early HMDs that um, I was using, uh, well, I was using with colleagues down in Sussex, uh, which for, for I don't know, I, I don't know you, so I don't know if there's any HMD aficionados there, but they are Kaiser Electro Optics, uh, if anyone uh, with an Intersense screwed on the top there, you can just about see it. Um, 
but nowadays you know you have whole companies don't you oculus is owned by facebook and the general principle behind both of these the, what we used in 2005 and what you can now get in 2020 uh is very simple it's it's two screens pressed up against people's eyes um with lenses uh which help distort the image slightly and there's a tracker a head tracker involved uh, nowadays taken from mobile technology rather than screwed on the top um, but it tracks your head movements and it updates the digital world such that you can look around yourself you have a 360 environment to look around you replace the world around you with something now the graphics have improved somewhat as well uh, and of course you can do lots of things with this you can nowadays you've got multiple ways of interacting with them you can play games you can do puzzle games and shooters you can play rhythms or you can just go for walks in nature or drift down streams or visit places in the world you've never been to so there's a lot going on but what is sort of at the, at the core of it is you're you're replacing your perceptual experience with a digital one um and i think we should all know quite intuitively uh, that if you sort of replace the world around you, put you in an, an unfamiliar setting, uh, then that is uh, hugely demanding of your cognitive resources, hugely demanding of your attention. Now, if you've used a HMD, you probably will know this for yourself. You don't just sort of pop it on and keep thinking about your shopping or what you plan to cook for dinner in the evening. You're, you're dragged in, absorbed in this this world and whatever it might be. But more broadly, if, if even if you're not used one, you're trying to sort of understand what I mean by this attention demand just think about when you've gone perhaps on holiday to somewhere un or just somewhere unfamiliar uh, you know walking into the hotel of the lobby <laughs> hotel of the lobby <laughs> the lobby of the hotel uh, and taking it all in uh, the amount of information the people the things it can seem overwhelming but by the end of your holiday you kind of you know it inside out and you're, you're barely attending to any of it uh, sort of going into any new environment that sort of floods your, se floods your senses um, that is highly attention, uh, highly demanding of attention, highly demanding of your cognitive resources uh, and everything else. And that's what I love about the technology. That's what I love about headmen and displays is because they have this power to just essentially take over uh, your cognition. Um, yeah. So how could we use that productively? How have we found ways uh, to do that? So obviously the principles I'm running with at the moment are that we, we have these sort of limited resources, which we have to carefully balance. Um, actually, sometimes it, it'd be useful to be overwhelmed, to, to stop thinking about things, to stop processing some things. And indeed, HMDs seem to be really good at that. So let's look at uh, two quick applications. Uh, so the first example will be from pain perception, uh, where we talk about using HMDs to manage pain. And there's a lot of research around this. I'm, 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 never, I'm not going to pretend ours is the only. Uh, this is there's worldwide efforts around this and then we'll talk about managing trauma which was this sort of more pilot work that we've been doing uh, which hasn't it's been cited a few times but other people aren't picking up on it um, um, and then we'll leave it open to the, the possibilities beyond that but really what I'm hoping to demonstrate to you is that the, this technology has a potential even if it's just in your everyday life uh, to, to, to be quite powerful uh, and useful. So we start with this example with pain management then. Uh, so I'll tell you just a little bit about the research that I did with someone called Sarah Johnson, uh, who was a student at the time. Um, so it's back in 2015, so that's sort of five years ago. I said I'm, I'm under no illusions that, we're, that no one else is doing this sort of stuff. Um, so Hunter Hoffman over in the, the United States uh, was using this uh, originally, used uh, a head, head mount display, nothing quite like what's uh, on show there, but a bigger head mount on display uh, with uh, troops with burns. So troops you know, been close to exploding bombs uh, and this kind of things so who had horrible burns, uh, who have to get their wounds redressed uh, on, on a quite regular basis. And that's going to be a very painful, so wound redressing, I understand, I haven't had personal experience, but I understand can be a very painful experience. Uh, and what he did is he used a headset um, so the, the, the troops were sort of staring around them uh, and playing a game called Snow World, which involved drifting down a river and throwing snowballs at snowmen on the side. Um, and uh, he did that whilst they got redressed. And obviously the, the evidence was very clear um, that uh, the soldiers were able to tolerate a great amount of pain and the intensity was a lot less when engaged in a virtual environment. Now, there's been lots of demonstrations of it since uh, from sort of uh, everything from dental uh, dental work getting sort of 
traumatic dental work done um, uh, through to, I believe there's been trials uh, of people using it during labor. Um, there's people who've had uh, lumbar punctures. Um, I believe, uh, if the reports are correct, that people have actually uh, undergone surgery and, and used it as an alternative to, to traditional anesthetics and so on and so forth. Um, the evidence is, is, is growing, uh, particularly for acute pain. Um, so acute pain being pain that is occurring um, because of something that is occurring within that moment, whether it's a wound dressing, whether it's labor, whatever it might be. Uh, there's sort of some early evidence, although it's much harder to measure around chronic pain as well. So chronic pain being pain uh, that lasts for a very long time and is part of someone's everyday life and comes and goes. Um, so there's various evidence. So what I'm going to tell you about very quickly just what we did. So we were obviously more sort of interested in the psychological basis of these things. Uh, and we were putting forward an argument that whilst uh, a lot of these things are done sort of in laboratories or in hospitals with sort of large setups that in practice, uh, if this was to ever be used more widely, uh, people would just use the sort of off the shelf Oculus headsets and, and headphones and this sort of thing. And the question we asked was the, about the inclusion of sound. So uh, it's possible to include sound as well as the visuals. And there's sort of several possibilities there. Uh, one possibility is that the sound makes no difference. And this is important for a clinical point of view because potentially you want to be able to talk to the person who's engaging with it um, as, as you kind of you know, redressing or, or, or doing surgery on their teeth or whatever it might be. Um, uh, but then there's also a possibility uh, if we believe everything that we believe as cognitive psychologists, uh, that by including sound, it demands more attentional resources. And by doing so, it sort of potentially increase uh, someone's pain tolerance or someone's pain in, or, or lessen their pain in the intensity of the pain they're experiencing. Um, so in our setup, the way we kind of administer pain, oh, lovely phrase, uh, within uh, a laboratory setup is using a cold water bath. So this is uh, water cooled all the way down to one degree. Um, so one degree is quite hard to keep your hand in. Uh, and we take a couple of measures. So we measure how long someone can keep their hand in, which is called pain tolerance. And then we get into sort of rate on scales, uh, how intense the pain was uh, after they've done it. So we can take measures of tolerance and intensity. Um, and tolerance is a really interesting one because it's not a self-report, it's how long someone can literally keep their hand in. Um, so uh, it's a nice sort of physical measure. And we use, as if you're wondering why we sort of choose cold presser, it's called a cold presser technique. The reason we choose that sort of really cold water is because, you know, it's, it's not going to leave any permanent scars. We're not going to actually hurt someone in the long term, but it's, it's a painful, temporary painful experience. It's a good example of acute pain. Um, so we've got 30 participants to, to take part in it. And they did a variety of conditions. I'm just going to show you the graph, skip straight to the graph. Um, so what they uh, did is they did it in baseline, which was uh, just having the, the HMD on and, and the headphones and, and not playing anything through it and not listening to anything. Uh, in some conditions, we played them just sound. Some, they, they played a game. So in the picture here, it's a game called Radial G. It's a futuristic racer, uh, and they played that. Uh, or they played the racer and had the, the accompanying sounds as well. So all kind of matched across them. They did it in a randomized order. There was, there was 30 of them. And I can give you more details if you if you really care. Um, but the sort of key to this is the pain tolerance down this side here. So this is in seconds, so 90 seconds obviously being a minute and a half. Uh, and if we just look at the, the extremes, you know, on average, people could keep their hand in the water for around 30 seconds. We had a safety cutoff of, of four minutes, which was only ever exceeded by people who worked in freezers for a living uh, in restaurants. Um, no one else really met that. Um, and then uh, at the other end here, we have uh, people able, the same person, bearing this is all within the same person, the same person uh, on the, or the same 30, on uh, when having both sound and HMD, able to keep their, their hand in for over twice as long. So almost two and a half times longer. Um, so they're able to tolerate more pain merely by being distracted. And you can see there was a nice little progression to it. Uh, all of these differences are statistically significant, if that's something that you care about. Um, so, uh, you know, sound on its own uh, was a little bit more distracting, so demanded slightly more attentional resources. Uh, HMD on its own demanded more attentional resources than sound does, and that makes quite logical sense, listening to, to sound effects versus your whole visual world changing. Um, and then uh, the two in combination. 
uh, appear to be the most effective. So it's all kind of consistent with this this idea that um, even though we're talking about pain, but by uh, flooding one's attentional resources, uh, the ability to to pay any sort of attention to the pain, um, we're kind of we're able to to lessen it, not reduce it, not eliminate. This is no way of eliminating pain, but merely uh, by focusing someone on something else um, in quite a dramatic way, uh, we're able to increase that tolerance and, and lower that intensity. So there you go. So that's example number one, trying to demonstrate to you just sort of one of these sort of interesting ways we can use HMDs because of this attentional quality and because of the way that we process things naturally. The uh, other example I want to provide you with uh, is a lot more details so I'm going to skip over very briefly. Um, but uh, there's a lovely little paradigm that was developed down in Oxford by Emily Holmes, um, which involves showing people a traumatic film. So this is how we, we understand trauma. So very early on in trauma um, and part of the trauma diagnosis, uh, we have uh, intrusive memories. So this is when an uh, image uh, comes back into one's mind when we didn't want it to of a traumatic event, whatever that traumatic event might be. Um, yeah. Uh, so they have they their sort of little paradigm was to present a traumatic film, which is this sort of short film, sort of 13, 14 minutes long with lots of sort of cut scenes of so you can see there the burning car but that's crashed. So that's upside down. Um, someone who appears to be dying, bleeding from their ear, someone cutting themselves while shaving. And even I'm not making anyone feel horrible like or traumatizing them by merely describing it uh, but it's lots of lots of scenes one wouldn't normally want to see obviously the participants who signed up knew exactly that's what was going to happen and in our little path here so we take a various measures at the start so some of these are sort of depression measures anxiety measures previous trauma uh, merely to make sure our groups are sort of on equivalent levels we measured their mood they saw the traumatic film measured their mood again did a few tasks in the middle just to, to pass the time had a reminder about the film and then we're put in three conditions so one that was our do nothing condition two was our play tetris so all of this uh uh sort of literature very interestingly revolves around tetris and i'll explain that in one second uh play tetris using a hmd or play tetris uh using a computer and our logic being that if you use a hmd uh it just uh be more attentionally demanding than just playing tetris on a desktop now if you're wondering why tetris um the idea is that after seeing uh, a traumatic film, we have uh, a sort of, I said there's sort of general attentional cognitive resources that we use, but there's also some which are specific to different modalities. So uh, visual information is processed. There's a set of resources we use to process visual information, so sort of unconsciously whilst we're going about our daily lives. And the logic here is that uh, Tetris is a very strong visuospatial task. It involves lots of visual movement and, and uh, interaction uh, and as such it, it prevents those same resources being dedicated to, to replaying the film to bedding it down to to, to consolidating that into a, into a, a strong memory so the idea is if you load this visual system up uh, with something else then the opportunity to essentially rehearse and uh, consolidate that traumatic film is, is lessened um so there's less opportunity and then once time has passed uh, your mind naturally stops sort of trying to consolidate these things and so there's an opportunity for it to sort of drift off into to, to never be remembered again so uh the idea is then you sort of fill that period measure their mood then there's various other measures we did or won't bore you with uh and then at the end we had this seven day intrusion diary so uh they spent uh they had to record every time they had a sort of traumatic memory uh, or recalled something from the film within seven days and here you can see sort of our mean number of intrusions again it was 30 people split between the three groups so 10 in each so those who did no task on average had sort of seven intrusive memories and those who did tetris or play tetris in virtual reality on average had sort of one or two intrusive memories across that seven day period um, so again, stats geeks amongst you, those two are statistically significant, so different from each other. Uh, the middle condition was different from neither, so playing it on a desktop actually wasn't different from doing nothing, uh, and equally uh, wasn't different from virtual reality, but the very key one 
doing it within virtual reality seemed to have this big impact. And indeed, once we drilled down into it, it was really to do with the first two days. So the biggest difference was in those first two days where people would have the majority of those intrusive memories. But had they played virtual reality, they didn't. And rather curiously as well, in our mood measures, completely unpredicted, people were a lot happier having played Tetris in the HMD. Um, but that was just a, a weird side effect. But anyway, so that was the stuff we did with Sarah Page. Must acknowledge Sarah's, uh, which was a, a master student at the time. Um, so there you go. So I've come to the end. I'm hoping to, to sort of convinced you of a few things. Uh, so I'm trying to convince you through those various demonstrations that, uh, believe it or not, attentional resources, cognitive resources in general, are really essential for processing our world around us all the time in ways that we're sometimes thoroughly unaware of unless cheeky cognitive psychologists come along and, and point them out to us. Um, but there is something about having less resources to, to process the world around us, particularly in terms of things like trauma um, and pain perception, perceiving pain. And VR, so virtual reality, is really good at consuming those uh, those uh, resources. So there's potential if you're ever thinking about VR or if you ever if you ever do uh, wish I hadn't seen that or I wish I didn't know that, you know, pop on a VR headset is the argument I'm going to put. Uh, engage yourself in a totally different world uh, for, you know, 20, 30 minutes. Uh, and we find uh, at least the, there's a lot of evidence that it can help with pain management. And we have this very preliminary evidence from our, from our labs at York St. John uh, that it can also help minimize these sort of traumatic memories as well. But I say there's more possibilities out there in my head, for everything from ruminating um, about how presentation has gone um, all the way through to, uh, you know, trying to minimize food cravings or cigarette cravings or whatever it might be. There's so many possibilities uh, for using this technology that are just, yeah, just sort of waiting there to be explored. There you go. So yeah, so just over 40 minutes. Um, but I hope that was uh, of interest to anyone. I'm not sure. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and sort of turn it over to, to questions if uh, it seems appropriate to do so. Sorry, bear with me for one second. There we go. Um, So I should be back. You are. Awesome. Do we stop the recording at this point or do we keep recording for questions? What's the... Usually keep it going for questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and then in the end, we send it to Dale. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> well, there you go. I think I've over, uh, hopefully I've overwhelmed everyone too much. <laughs> um, but yeah, are, are there any questions, comments, uh, any discussion you want to have, anything you want to ask of me? Uh, I'm here, I'm open. Can I say that I found it absolutely fascinating? Oh, yes. So, so just as a person who does have pain, but yeah, <laughs> but oh, also well. who can't use headsets. So that's a tricky one for you. Uh, no, well, actually, no, this is really fascinating. Uh, uh, is that the is this efficacy has been demonstrated here. It works in a lab. How we do it in the real world is a different thing. Um, and I've got a real strong argument. I think that headsets should come preloaded with stuff. So you literally just put it on and it just starts. I think there are huge barriers to, to lots of it. And um, yeah, anyway, yes, yes. Not so to worry. We'll, we'll let Moira we'll in. Yes, yes, <laughs> please, please go ahead. Hello, is there any research done uh, with this to help with bereavement? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Not that I'm aware of uh, is, is the simple answer to that. Is that, is that a particular topic of interest for yourself? Uh, well, in general, psychology, human behavior. But um, well, with Bridgman, is something where the people is like, uh, people are immersed in the feelings and the thoughts and uh, the emotions. And it's very difficult to manage because there is no solution to the situation. Yeah, that's very interesting. Because um, I did, I had an idea a long time ago, and you're going to tell me it's the worst idea in the world. Um, of, uh, well, it we came up in a conference conversation about using sort of virtual environments to create um, a significant other, a virtual significant other, to give them the opportunity to say goodbye to it, uh, to them in one way or another. But I think that's, I think that's probably a bad idea, <laughs> having said it out loud. Thank uh, you. Yes, yes, but yes, not I'm aware of. I think there's a wide open field there. Yes. 
We've got another question up. How does VR work with children? Oh, no, that's, um, it's an excellent question. I think we generally don't know at the moment. A lot of this is going to be new territory stuff. So um, it kind of, it's a very broad question. I'll, I'll be, I'd be uh, interested to see if there's a very specific context you're thinking about, whether you want to say it out loud or, or put it in there. But in very broad terms, uh, when, when sort of VR came out, uh, all of the health warnings were don't use it in, for under 11s and 12s and so on and so forth. Now, you can find plenty of examples of people breaking that now. Um, and there's plenty of applications of it in schools, people taking, you know, virtual trips to the moon um, and being used quite successfully. Um, so <laughs> it all depends on the, the how willing you are to take risks, I think. Um, but I think that I'd be confident that it's probably being processed slightly differently. Um, but we're not at a stage where we can understand exactly how uh, a child would be processing that sort of environment um, would be my, my my guess at the moment. But where, where I've seen it used most for children is in applications, usually educational ones. Yeah. Moira, again, is your hand up again, Moira? Um, yes, actually, my chat box doesn't seem to work. Um, my question wasn't specific to um, for children with trauma. So how does uh, with that? So like, suppose we're using VR therapy for, um, you know, as like a therapy, like exposure therapy or something. OK, um, so, so there's two different things in there. So the, the one hand, I think, so we've not it's not been explored in terms of distraction. So in terms of kind of what we're talking about here, in terms of say uh, exposure therapy, exposure therapy is that other area, isn't it, where VR has uh, been uh, used in different circumstances. So I believe where uh, VR has been used for trauma, um, it can in some circumstances be a case of sort of reliving the event, uh, particularly where it's been used uh, for soldiers uh, to relive sort of war scenarios uh, and to then help them within the therapy to, to process that in, in different ways or to reprocess it in different ways. Uh, now, I am unaware of it being used with children in that context so specifically to deal with, deal with trauma. Where it has been used to deal with trauma, it often has been, as far as I'm aware, uh, circumstances where it's easy to recreate uh, the the traumatic episode or uh, a similar traumatic experience, uh, VR, Iraq, that kind of thing, uh, has been used with US troops. But yeah, I don't know, unless you can tell me otherwise, I'm unaware of it being used because it's such an individual thing. Um, yeah, there's probably potential there for it, but the, the sort of exposure therapies I'm aware of much more center on sort of fear of flying, fear of spiders, fear of heights, things that sort of a common uh, experiences that can be created. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Sorry. Thank you so much. Yeah, lots of more work to be done, I guess is is my the answer to that. Sue, your hand, you had your hand up before. Do you still want to say something? I was just going to ask that. How does it work? We, you said it, that it, it works via distraction, but is is some of that because that distraction has no risk involved? So a virtual world is risk free. Oh, no, that's, that's an interesting one. Uh, the, the truth is uh, that we don't know um, entirely how every mechanism works. I think whenever you get sort of really drilled down to these things, there's nuances. So there's nuances in the way that things work and there's nuances in the individual as well. Um, so if I can give you an example, there's I know there was uh, someone we put into a VR scenario uh, where there was a sofa and she, for whatever reason, uh, was utterly convinced that someone was going to leap out from behind that sofa. So uh, just to, to draw on your example, so the, the idea that it's, it's kind of risk free, um, some individuals do react to these things slightly differently and uh, can uh, put things on top of them that, that we don't intend. Uh, so whether it's because it's risk free, I'm not sure. Uh, for some of these, we have taken measures of anxiety. So uh, what we call anticipatory anxiety. Uh, so the anxiety associated with the an anticipation of the pain. And there is some sort of early evidence in, in oh, stuff we've not written up yet, uh, that uh, VR can help uh, lower some of those sort of anxiety measures um yeah so there you go so that's that's my answer is potentially it, it can do with man it can part of it might be to do with uh the risk-free nature and the, the the lessening of anxiety absolutely uh that's an excellent question but we don't have the data yet 
but yes, sounds good. Thank you. I think we're losing people now. We're down we are now we're on time. But, but, but can I just say thanks ever so much, Matthew? That was oh. really, absolutely, it was fascinating, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> and really, really, and really different and not necessarily what I'd expected. I'm not sure what I'd expected, but it was, it was super. So thanks ever so much because oh, uh, yours is the last one for this year. Oh, is it? Of the webinars, yeah. Um, but we start again in October. Oh, very good. Well, maybe so, in, a, in a year's time, I can come back and have more proper answers <laughs> to some of these questions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you say that, I, c I will probably hold you to it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, well, your end of the deal is to go get a headset in between, see if it helps manage chronic pain. <laughs> well, except that it makes me dizzy. Oh, and does it? And oh, sick. No. Yeah. So that's my issue. Yeah. yeah no, cyber sickness is a real issue as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah no, no. no. So but many. Not barriers. to worry. I manage myself. I'm just used to it. <laughs> Yes, you do. No, fair enough. Fair enough. But thanks yeah. ever so much again. No, no, thank okay. You. Thank you for, for and hosting. We will, and we'll keep in touch. Oh, cheers. Was that Moira? Sorry. I think so. Here. I was just saying thank you so much for the session. Awesome. Thank you. I'm glad people took something from it. Great. Lovely. Okay. Um, thank I'll stop you. the recording now. Uh, yeah. So, in terms of this, then, will you get a copy of the recording? Do you think because I cite it up, or do you think 